Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art Chat. I'm your host, Linda Riesenberg Fissler, and I have, I, I'm actually very, very excited about having this guest on Art Chat. Her name is Karen Espina, and Karen works in the independent film industry. Is that a, a good way of putting that, Karen? Um, yes, I, I, um, that's one way. <laughs> one way. Okay. So I'll ask you to talk about yourself in a second and you can fill us into what, you know, your titles are basically movie producer, I guess is, is a good way of starting that. I also have with me my co-founder at Artistic Harmonies Association, and that's John Anderson. Hi, John. Welcome. Hi, how you doing? I'm really happy to be here and especially happy to, to welcome Karen to the program. Uh, Karen is a member of Artistic Harmonies Association, and she has a lot of things that she can contribute. I met Karen through the Tennessee Women in Film Media Association, and we just became good friends, and we have brainstormed together and had our coffee and tea clashes, and, but really glad you're here, Karen. Thank you. Yeah, so Karen, I, I would love for you to tell us about yourself um, and what your relation is to the fine arts in film and media, what that connection is. So go ahead. <laughs> um, I have a master's in fine arts, but particularly in film and media. And the interesting thing about film and media is that it is a collaborative art form that encompasses a huge broad range of people um, in varying skills and areas of the arts. And if you've ever sat through maybe like some of the recent films like Top Gun or whatever and just sat and looked at the credits at the end, that is the staggering numbers of professionals in their areas of arts that come into play in this art form. Um, I am an independent film um, uh, person. I, I both write and produce but I also work in commercial film, um, which is, <laughs> I, I'm in development right now for some major feature films, uh, at least two. We are uh, producers of documentaries that through Hummingbird Productions. I've been on maybe five different documentaries that I've participated in. Um, uh, another independent uh, director producer friend of mine, we did a, a documentary for The Farm um, which is a little place out in Smith County. It's the oldest commune in the United States. Um, so as, a, as an independent producer, I, I go both ways. I can be attached through a commercial production company or studio, or I can be independent. So I just wanted to clarify that because, um, which will kind of lead us down the way later to another question about what this art form is and um, why, Arts is not always such art. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I, uh, obviously, is that the word I was looking for? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so yeah, so there is this big difference between um, independent films, uh, which I think you could probably say has a wider window of creativity for them, the, the filming itself. It, versus um, the commercial industry or, or the Hollywood industry, if you want to refer to it that way. Since we started talking a little bit about uh, fine arts, what, let's, let's go back to what do you mean by fine arts, since it's not what we typically consider when, when we, you know, typically when you say fine arts, I always think of a, a, a painter or something in that realm versus a fine art in, the, in, in media. Let's just put it that way, in media. Yeah, it's really, it's really a fun kind of um, world of definition because there's a real social snobbery <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the definition of fine art, which I find humorous because <laughs> so when, you go back and you, yeah, when you go back and you look at some of the major artists in history, they were totally commercial artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think of the Vatican and all of the different art forms in, um, if you ever go to Venice and you see the uh, sponsorship and I love it, they say sponsorship mm -hmm. of these varying artists that um, were involved in the art and ar architecture for hundreds of years in Venice that built that city and in Florence and, um, and on 
where the distinction of fine art almost became uh, that there was a certain patronage by the wealthy yes. as opposed to a person earning their keep. However, every single artist that they involved were earning their keep to working for their patrons, yes. <laughs> you know, whether that be the church or uh, whatever. So I, I get a little tickled at where that line begins and ends because now, of course, you see pop art becoming a fine art. And um, oh gosh, I've forgotten who it was that did the Campbell Soup Can. Um, Warhol. Yes. Uh, it, <laughs> At that point in time, I love the honesty that he brought to the table is that there have been fabulous artists in every area of commercial business for years. Mm -hmm. And the whole film industry has been built around um, the fine artists. And I mean, you've got sets and props and you've got, um, uh, well, especially in old Hollywood, every backdrop was a fine art painting. Mm -hmm. There were, there were tons of sets and designs that were completely built around fakery and things that were not real, but that um, exploited the uh, artistic talent of the arts community to make it real or as believable as possible. So um, you have animation with, it, uh, you know, starting with Mickey Mouse, the simple yeah. little Mickey Mouse. And it is completely art. That is, that is an art form that um, in the film industry that is built from the art to the text, as opposed to the other way around, mm -hmm. you know, where they'll draw gags, they'll draw all kinds of silliness and, and then build uh, actual text to it or actual story to it sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the more um, art driven forms of the film industry. Yeah. So it's, it's a fine line to say where fine art begins and where it ends, because as artists and art forms become venerated, uh, you know, looking back in history, nine times out of 10, you, you will see more and more of the commercial forms gaining real acceptance. And um, I think it's quite sad sometimes that there's that snobbery. I remember going to a film festival and I was at the party, you know, with everyone who's, who's somebody. And I had just ventured over the line from commercial, commercial, like working in industry and in the corporate level into art form creativity. And so a woman asked me my background and I'm talking about having worked in uh, academia with Vanderbilt University and in the um, media part of that part or that uh, program and then going into corporate America and working with training and development and new product launches and marketing. And she goes, oh, you did that and that's exactly what she said to me in exactly the tone <laughs> and I almost laughed because I thought oh my gosh you know that it's that kind of money that pays for most of the art that goes mm -hmm. on in America so <laughs> uh, yeah I think it's a crazy fine line and I probably said too much on that but oh, that's <laughs> that's fine um yeah so I don't know, I had like 20 different questions when, when you were talking about that, but, but I wanted to actually ask you to tell us a little bit about um, Hummingbird production and what your role is there. Um, at Hummingbird, I have, um, when I decided to jump full force into the creative parts of media and film, I actually stumbled onto an old acquaintance of 15 years in an elevator. You talk about the elevator pitch, mine yeah. was real. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> but I had gone to a, um, what was a breakfast club of people that were from like Sony and um, different, the differing companies that are in media and film in Nashville and, um, and Franklin. And so I ran into Bob Farnsworth, who was the CEO of the company and chief creative officer. And he was uh, telling me, cause I said, oh my gosh, I met you 15 years ago, crazy. And when my girlfriend um, and her husband worked for you. And so we talked about that for a moment, but then he started talking about what he was doing currently. And uh, he starts talking about working on a sequel to It's Wonderful Life. And, <laughs> and it was so odd because just the week before I had talked to uh, one of my professors at, I was working on my MFA and MBA at the same time at Lipscomb in their film department and had just spoken to a professor who was involved on the same project. And so I said, I would love to work on this project. And voila, there I was. Oh, I became cool. a part of the development team for that particular project. And 
um, have stayed. And Hummingbird is an award-winning producer of commercials, sound design, original music. And then they, as of that time, had just begun um, adding filmmaking to its creative artistry. So Hummingbird collaborates with world-renowned creatives on projects from, gosh, every conceivable product, service, or brand across every platform. So they've worked with artists like Dolly Parton. Um, uh, we worked specifically on our documentary with Emmy Award-winning John Rice davies um, Grammy Award winners like Reba McIntyre, Clint Black, uh, companies like IMAX and Dolby. And we actually did um, one of Dolby's two um, premier sound design um, special advertising that they do for their theaters and for their sound equipment. So we did that with them and we've worked, gosh, the Budweiser Frogs is what they're famous for. Oh they yeah. Have, yeah, the Budweiser Frogs is one of the top 10 best TV commercials of all time. And if you take any kind of a marketing class where you talk about advertisements, you will talk about the Budweiser Frogs. <laughs> yeah, so it's, exactly it's or do the blood wise yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly I know, I know we uh don't have time today particularly but uh there's an interesting backstory that linda told me about the budweiser frogs but <laughs> if you look into hummingbird you'll see that uh, gosh they've worked with ford motor company budweiser just some major brands so uh kudos to to Karen. Karen for being involved in that from just about every level so yeah yeah it's it's been a great thing to be able to work with those companies and um we we don't stop there you know it's it's a real kind of creative environment we we, we know so many people in so many types of industries that you, literally Bob can pick up the phone and <laughs> call and talk to just about anyone you know that's an artist or Grammy award winners or whatever and we can um kind of put together something unique and, and interesting. So that's been a real blessing to kind of work with that company because it is um, in the Clio Hall of Fame Award, which Clio's are the big thing for, um, Clio's and Lions Awards are the huge thing for the commercial marketing industry. Mm -hmm. So to be so numbered and have so many awards, I mean, literally <laughs> we have so many awards that we don't even pick up some <laughs> when they <laughs> come around. We just don't pick them up because where are you going to put them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a nice problem to have, right? <laughs> yeah, it is a really good problem to have. But um, but that's kind of a fun aspect of, of where I come from and who I've been affiliated with. And right now we're currently working on something for the 75th anniversary of the city of Greenville for their symphony. So, oh. yes, yeah, so we get to work with all kinds of people, all kinds of places and and is that Greenville in Tennessee or Greenville, South Carolina? South Carolina. Okay, so you're not far from me. I'm down. I'm in Asheville, so yeah, we should meet halfway at some point. <laughs> yeah, have a good. coffee. Have a coffee and tea. Yeah, yeah. you can come to the hot chocolate <laughs> between. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> so definitely. yeah, cool. So in your role there, um, um, uh, I am. I'm on the creative team. I'm. I call myself an admin creator because I. I do stuff in-house just for the company, but I also um, uh, am a creative person on the produ production side, on writing. I do a lot of writing. Um, so, uh, but I do that not just for Hummingbird, for lots of other places. Um, yeah, it's since it's a boutique, uh -huh. I get to wear lots of hats. And, <laughs> well, mainly producer, always fun too. Mainly producer. Mainly producer, okay. Um, yeah, so it's always fun that you never get bored with one particular thing. It's, it's almost like, what do I want to work on my to-do list today since it's so long? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and it changes, you know, um, the, the arts community is kind of like the weather. <laughs> you know, it, and it, it seriously is, especially I tell people this, that if they're coming into a career and they're not going to attach themselves to a studio or a company per se, where they do graphic or some type of artwork all the time, that as an independent or as someone who contracts, you're really riding the wave of feast and famine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it, it works out that way. You have times and seasons where you are so busy, you think, how in the world am I ever going to make it through this? And then there will be times where you're sitting and watching spiders spin webs, praying that, you know, some idea will make bank or some right. presentation or some pitch or you know something because we don't tend to make a lot of products in in my field of work that you don't have 
someone already attached to pay for because you find out real soon <laughs> i'm not a painter but <laughs> if i were a painter paint costs money oh yes <laughs> canvas costs money yes. and so it's yeah it's better to propose an idea or have an idea of someone paying for it before you actually go to the table with it but you know in the in the essence of the creative person that you are i do it i write spec stuff i do all kinds of crazy spec things and then think why did i do that why did i spend that time <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, the most <laughs> precious part, no matter if it's paints, oils, canvas, you know, um, set specs, whatever, is exactly. the time. You know, there's it's, been it's, more than one or two artists that have set paintings aside, so they're already invested. And uh, <laughs> it's the same with writing. Uh, Linda has written uh, four novels, and she's mm -hmm. working on her fifth right now in a series. And gosh, you know, when I call her and I say, hey, what's up? And she says, well, I'm going in the studio to paint and then I'm going to write in my book. And so she's constantly juggling the different art forms mm -hmm. herself. And then, of course, she's got AHA, which is artistic harmony. So she does such a great job with. OK, well, I didn't mean to interrupt. But no, no, it's, not an, yeah, it's not an interruption. It's not an interruption. And it actually helps me kind of come back around to where my, my original kind of point was, is that I, I hope that every artist that's listening to me realizes that there's nothing wrong with being commercial, that that it is it is still fine art. It is still, um, although people want to classify label and, um, you know, put things together, but I did an art show um, for, I don't know if you know John Cherry III, he recently passed away, but he was the director, um, the Disney and local independent director of the whole Ernest franchise. Ernest Goes to Camp, Ernest, you know, all those different movies. Well, he did storyboards and he was an incredible watercolor artist. So when I um, featured him, his whole team as a panel at a conference, I did a gallery of just his um, storyboards that were incredible and we sold them from there for quite a good sum because they were beautiful, beautiful artwork. And so you have people like this all through the industry who are major artists, but sometimes you don't see all of their artwork or see their work until much later or somewhere you know down the pike. And so don't fret about your commerciality because it may be the door that opens to your so-called fine art reality. But I, I, don't think, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think they are one and the same. And Linda, this, is, this goes back to what, how you and I became so involved in artistic harmonies and that we wanted to have that dual interest of not only the particular art form that's being presented, but the business side of that. So that you can focus on the, the fact that you want to get to a jumping off point as Karen did, where she said, well, I'm going to move right into the, the fine arts and be involved in specific areas. So knowing about business and knowing about the arts, it really go hand in hand. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the one thing, I'm going to take this back over more towards the, the visual and, and creative side. We can certainly talk business side if, if we want, but um, no. No. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, let's go to the creative side. I think John just voted for staying on the creative side. Um, so, I, you know, I can remember like a, a number of films. Um, there's this visual part of, um, of it, and we are talking visual arts, but there's this um, also the creative writing side of it as well. So if I think of like, let's say Dunkirk, for example, um, you know that that visually that film is astounding and you know just the planes flying over and the the sun setting and it just i mean there's not a lot of dialogue but you don't really need a lot of dialogue because there's so much being said visually so karen let's talk a little bit about how the visual arts meet the creative writing piece of this um can you talk about how that works in your field yes and I love the fact that film actually began silent yeah. because it was completely a visual art in its, in its beginning. 
eventually a story grew in that art form um, past the Lumiere brothers into the productions where people were coming and paying to see them yet again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they <laughs> decided to add a, occasionally the panels of um, text to help clarify what you're seeing go on the screen or to help embellish the understanding. Um, because in their era, people forget that there was a large part of the community that did not read, but there were, were a lot of people that because it was a paid art form were the readers. So they were wanting more clarification on stories, more information about what's going on on the screen. Mm -hmm. So it became a, a, um, a completely melded art form early on. Mm -hmm. And um, music was added, of course, as a sidebar and it eventually became one of the parts of the art form also because one of the things that we talk about in our company is fusic, which is a sound design because hearing it is believing. Sometimes sound drives a story. You can take the same picture and depending upon what music that you put with it or what sound bed you put with it will change how you view that scene. Mm -hmm because now hearing has become a part of the element of the visual. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it just alters reality. And that's it, it's an art form that Bob actually teaches on um, at schools. And um, he's actually done some um, oh, TED Talks on this particular thing, is that how that alters the reality. So it is a visual art form. It is driven by that, but text becomes a part of it, especially once realism became more a part of the film industry and it became less theatrical. Mm -hmm. But in the original formats, you had people that were theater people that were the filmmakers. You know, if they weren't pure um, silent, silent film people that were using the visual arts, they were people that were from theater that now wanted to introduce incredible theater arts to the screen. Mm -hmm. You know, and to embed those, I mean, where you can't take literally a, a company around the United States on a train, you know, to whatever little theaters were around. Now they could, you know, film them. And for every place that there was a film house, they could show those theatrical pieces. So it has had a lot of, uh, a lot of ways that, that text became a part of, um, of that visual art. And of course, if everybody for theater remembers the monologue is the big thing. And so you'll see a lot more monologue and a lot more dramatic scenes built around a speech and those kinds of things in old, older film, which you see much, much less of. But it's still, um, the creative writing part now has become an art form in itself. Um, it's called screenwriting. And um, screenwriting is uh, both technical, because it's expected that when you write a script, you're not just telling the story visually, but you're also helping direct the people that are filming the script, that are filming the story, to see it how you saw it. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that, you know, is a wide shot or, you know, it pans back or that all helps add emotion because part of the, um, part of the direction of the visual on a um, on a film or in a documentary is how a shot is taken to, to derive a certain emotional result. You know, close-ups yeah. in the eyes. I'm sorry, Karen, gonna... Karen. It's interesting that you you brought up the. I mean, how you've transitioned into the music in. Uh, Linda and I are looking uh, and interviewing with some artists that, that we have on board that are emphasizing the fact that you need to listen to the visual art just as the silent films came out. You know, a, a, a piece of a painting, a sculpture or whatever has its own voice in itself. And so Linda and I are looking at that and its significance and how it can add value to uh, an estate who's looking to to buy a particular piece of art. So it, I'm I'm really interested in how how you're going through this, uh, Linda. I don't know if you've got anything there you want to add with uh, our conversation with our artist friend who really did a great art chat uh, related to that. So, but anyway, uh, 
I, I, I'm all in favor of that because I, I think that music is, is, is basically the language that makes everything work, but that's just me. Yeah, I'm a drummer, so. <laughs> <laughs> the person that John's referring to is doing a lot of um, time and movement series of painting and breaking it down to quantum physics, if you will, and, you know, how particles and she, so she goes down to that level and looks at, you know, how, like just waving your hand in one way you, changes what you are actually seeing. So she's pulling all of that together. Fortunately, with a canvas, unless we put buttons or wire it in the back, I'm not sure we, that we could bring in any kind of voice. But <laughs> so yeah, that's, ahead, that's really fascinating. I, I, I wonder if there were any pointillist artists that talked about in their age some of the the potential of that in whatever language that would have been in their time because pointillism was so down to the minutia of color and design so that'd be interesting to follow up on but pixels um, before pixels <laughs> yes 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 but yeah. you know the irony is is that everything that we know i mean my my initial college degree is in convergent technology the mediums by which people in radio television and film and then um uh the computer have allowed this art to you know converge forward but what's fantastic about it now is that um it can give you a whole experience as an art form so that now the the painting can have an audio type of uh, potential you know and you can go into a film which is that whole um multimedia presentation now starry starry night with um mm -hmm. van gogh's paintings that you can walk into the painting mm -hmm. and so there's all these fantastic transmedial potential where i could take storyboards and turn them into a graphic novel i could take you know all these different parts that are of the art of whatever it is that you're doing and recreate it oh, yeah. into some other you know transform it into some other part and form of what is that quantum reality that mm -hmm. your person is talking about and that that's what makes art right now so exciting and and why i love to blur the lines of where commercial and fine begin and end because you there there's no end to where it could go if you get excited about it and start thinking about that one painting's potential you know the people walking into it people hearing it people you know it, it, making it an experience for their life so it's really fantastic and and the writing part now you can assign a story to an image a past a present to that particular picture you know the characters that are in it the animals that are in it everything and anything can have a story that's a part of whatever that piece of art is. And that's where film is. You know, film is taking hundreds of images and, and devising the, the, the arc of this reality that you're watching into either fiction or nonfiction, mm -hmm. to telling you and delineating for you what my perception of that is. And it's always a director's perception and a writer's perception that that are, are on the screen plus you have all these other creative people that are helping you know to devise that perception but the writing part becomes a very technical both technical and artistic form that helps um bring this to the screen and there are all kinds of uh, screenplays i encourage people that are interested in screenwriting if you're interested in doing it one you have to learn the technical aspects so everybody's going to think you're a rube and never read anything you write <laughs> But then yeah. two, uh, yeah, because they're very picky in this industry yes, about making sure it's formatted correctly because you don't, you need to be able to get through it. And every page is about a minute of film. Mm -hmm. And so your story, they, they kind of have an idea of what's too long and what's too short. And right. so they tell you that. And of course, each, each part of the screenwriting reality is um, broken down into how many pages, whether it's a short film, uh, a feature short, a feature film an epic film, which they don't really talk about that so much anymore, but those are those two hour, you know, plus films that are um, telling you something way beyond what is normally set, sat through in film industry now. The Godfather. Because the stories <laughs> are epic, you know, in proportion. Yes. So um, 
Yeah, a lot of, of what you were saying, I when I was younger, I had a I, I wanted to be a screenwriter. And um, so I used to write, you know, being like eight and nine years old, you don't think about where's the camera coming in and what's the shot that I want to see? Do I want to fade to black or do I just want to cut or, you know, all of the different directions, if you will, that are there. And it's, it's really kind of interesting because um, I did a lot of dialogue. I just had the character's name, a, a colon, and then what they were saying, you know, did that like eight, nine, 10 years old, you know, had a lot of fun with it. Um, decided when I was 18, I was going to go out and become a screenwriter, um, go to USC and, and do that. You know, little yeah, did I yeah. know how much USC cost <laughs> at that yeah. time. Uh, didn't make it out there. Uh, so a lot of my um, free drafts and, and, you know, just write is, is more so dialogue. Most of my, my novels are dialogue because that's where I kind of you know, and then my paragraph, descriptive paragraphs are more of what you would get from a screenwriter um, type of, you know, person walked over, sat down on a chair, you know, that kind of um, descriptive dialogue. Uh, read a book written by Sidney Fields, or Sid Fields, excuse me, um, about, you know, he, he took apart Chinatown and all of the major movies back then and would teach you through this how to screenwrite. So uh -huh. it's kind of interesting. So um, the one thing that I do find with novel writing is I can continue the series. Like John said, I'm in book five now. Um, not really sure I see an end to these three characters that I'm developing <laughs> yet. Um, although with this never ending side of editing that I'm going through with this book, I really want to kill them all off at this point. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so you know, novels tend to have more time. Like you were saying, a movie is, you know, one page equals about a movie, a minute, a, a minute in a movie. Um, and, and you touched on it a little bit. I don't know if you have any more to say about, you know, why a script is so much different than a novel. I, in, in a novel, I know we do a lot of character development. That has to, does that have to be done more visually in a movie or well, a film? In in reference to scripts, and if you ever take a script writing class, one if you've got it, um, depending on how the professor's approach is, because you've got different right. thought processes. Right. Robert McKee is kind of the the guru of the film industry. Um, he's an author, lecturer, story um, consultant in Hollywood. That he he teaches something called story seminar, and there's lots of books and things out. But I, I highly recommend if you get a chance to see any of his master classes online or whatever that you look at them because he talks about the art form a lot. But the whole idea is to, to show, not tell. There are ways that you do tell, but dialogue should be um, intense and perfunctory in reference to driving the story. And if it doesn't drive the story, it needs to go mm -hmm. when you're doing film. Mm -hmm. Because you've got a couple constraints in film. One is the time. You've only got so much time that you can allow for people to sit through and watch. And then you've got money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'll have a producer breathing down your neck like me, who's telling you, uh, I can't, we can't shoot that scene. We've got this budget. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have the Titanic budget where it's 150 million <laughs> or 200 million and I can build a ship and I can, you know, make this whole whatever. And I can actually go to the ocean and go to do these things. No, we don't have that. What we have is <laughs> this amount of dollars to, yeah create that moment visually. So how do we do that to compel people to keep seeing the story and understanding the story and getting the driving force of the character arc and the, the development of the characters and the different underlying stories along the way without telling, telling, telling. Right. And if you watch a lot of, um, of the series that are on TV now, you can see when the writer's room is cheating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's usually when I groan, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, because uh, when, a, when a character's in thought, how do you how do you do that, you know, visually? Mm -hmm. How do you help people understand what the person's thinking? Well, you can create the interlude and shoot the whole thing. Well, sometimes they just don't have the time and the budget to do that. Mm -hmm. And so the person will be like talk, self-talk, thinking mm -hmm. out loud. 
-hmm. and they'll kind of give themselves the self-talk and you'll hear that. And I'm laughing because I, I know why they're doing the things <laughs> that they're doing, why they're using the plot devices in those particular places, because sometimes you just have to cheat it right? and you don't have a way to do it. And we're, we're not as creative as old Hollywood. Old Hollywood was fantastic about finding because they had those studios with just a dedicated force of people on a you know on a regular salary it saved them a fortune in budgets mm -hmm. by you know by being able to put that force behind stuff but um you would see them fake out sets and props with midgets um whatever to try to drive a story yeah to make it to fake it out Mm -hmm. to make it look as though it was the thing that you want to see instead of um, cheating with dialogue or trying to, you know, do something, they would figure out a way with all of their little minions, you know, to try to figure out how to, how to save face on the visual part. So I, that's why I love classic Hollywood is they had brilliant dialogue, incredible um, set design and whatever to force that story along. So you'll see some of the best things in the world. And I'll tell you who's doing it now is um, when you watch South Korean cinema, oh. they, they're incredible. They're like old Hollywood also. So it's, um, it's an art form. Less is more with the dialogue. You'll get, if you get a good professor, you turn in a screen, right, you know, for comments, <laughs> red mark, <laughs> show it don't tell it red mark red mark, red mark. you do all this dialogue you know yeah. how do how do you get out of that dialogue phase now novel you get to be jane austen yeah. you know you get to you know um wade through the minutia and make this beautiful world with every nuance and um every extra that you can put in it and that's what's great about the novel mm -hmm. and why people get so upset sometimes when they have novels or stories from a book form that they love and then they go to the theater <laughs> and they've had to chop out. I mean, you've got, well, how many pages in your not on each one of your novels are about, how, how many Linda in your oh, page? Yeah, total, um, somewhere between 250 to 300. So that would be a, a lot of money. You know? Yeah, and it'd be a lot of time in right. the theater. Yeah. So how do I take the best of the story arc and cut it into visual imagery to get it, you know, seen. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, have you guys seen Bridgerton? Shonda, Shonda Rhimes, she's already this crazy, incredible um, a storyteller creative, but she took those novels, Bridgerton novels, which again are, are you know, pretty complex yeah. and brought them to screen in a really highly emotional level. Well, and, and she has her own moral <laughs> sense when she does things. Right. So th they're extremely artistic, but she's done such a great job in preserving the visual element because you're when you're doing something like a Downton Abbey or you're doing something like Bridgerton, you've got to transcend time now. Right. So you've got to write dialogue that's believable in its time thing but yet not alienate the current people because not everybody's going to sit through Macbeth you know in the original <laughs> Shakespearean language and there have been some recent um remakes of some very famous Shakespeare films and they tank at mm -hmm. the box office but people do them because of their love for Shakespeare yeah. not because they're going to make a lot of money on them but you have people that just again they're pure artists they want to do those things and how do you how do you edit shakespeare right yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> yeah exactly you, you always yeah. have you always have a critic out there that won't like what you do and oh, um, when it comes to to shakespeare or anything um yeah but yeah so I, when you were talking about um you know how old hollywood used to swap out things to make something look taller or you know whatever i was thinking of the hobbit and um yeah. you know the jrr tolkien the not just the hobbit the, one, the lord of the rings um you know so here's peter jackson down in new zealand and he's creating all these different size props and things like that which i'm sure those movies cost a lot of money uh to do and then all of a sudden he's like well okay that's over and you know so now he's starting to make up stories and well he's probably not making them up there's probably i don't I've read the Lord of the Rings. I have, and, and I've read the Hobbit, but there are side stories that are coming out of that 
so that he can use those props in those scenes and those, you know, the sound stages or whatever again to, you know, so you, he has all that investment in it is what I'm saying. So he needs to, to use it. So it's kind of interesting from that standpoint as well. Yeah, I've forgotten which is the first of the films. Was it the Lord, Lord of the Rings? Rings? Yeah. yeah, it was his first film of that. And I was going to look up the budget on that really quickly because he, the irony is, is he went all the way to New Zealand because it was cheaper. <laughs> really? Okay. And did, uh, yeah. did not shoot like the enough footage for all three films? I don't know whether it was B. Well, he was or... doing double duty on some of it. He only had 93 million okay. on The Lord of the Rings. But look at the cast that he yes. Yes. engendered. And that's where people don't realize these artists demand a lot of money, you know, because the studio system had kind of broken down and actors became independent agents. You have to pay those kinds of fees. And people want to see those uh, incredible actors because they are true artists mm -hmm. and they really do bring these characters to life. So he was going to New Zealand because of incentives and things that help make it more affordable for him to do that film in the epic form that he wanted. Right. And, um, and in a, a landscape, because he shoots a little bit, and, and the Italians say that there's the only, there's only one true film art form and it's the Western. And so the Lord of the Rings is a very Western style mm -hmm. shooting of films. And <laughs> so I, I love that. I love that he, you know, he was sacrificing for his art to go someplace else. Now, not that New, New Zealand's not one of the most interesting places in the world to go. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> yes, it's killer. But that's, that's how you get there. And again, that's where art and commerciality, Come you know, together. have to meet. He yeah. wants to make this epic thing it, with the coolest sets he can devise. Mm -hmm. He literally built the Hobbit town later, you know, into the site. It's still there. You can go and see it. Yep. you know so how do, you, <laughs> so. Yeah, how do you create a world mm -hmm. for people in something that's fan and this is all fantasy mm -hmm. so now i've got i've got not just text that drives this story because you've got the original text that people have read and reread and whatever and you're going to bring that to the screen you talk about a burden on somebody <laughs> to bring a film to the screen i mean people were going to judge that thing coming and going so Absolutely. yeah, and I think he did an incredible job with that series. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, right, so let's um switch gears a little bit. And sure. because this one to me is 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 really interesting. Um, because I've never pitched anything in my life. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so how does one pitch a book or a script for production? Um the first thing I tell you is you better have some passion. <laughs> you know, there are professional pitch people that you can pay to pitch things. But honestly, um, from everyone that I talk to that has successful pitches, nine times out of 10, it's your passion that sells the project more so than it is the pitch. And believe me, there the pitches come in all shapes and sizes. And um, one of the guys that uh, pitched a remake of um, Lost in Space mm -hmm. was on a napkin. Really? You know, in, a, in a conversation. Yeah. You know, so... Um, but his enthusiasm and talking about what, why, why this, why now is what got him his opportunity. So, uh, the, but the major part of a pitch is, um, and there are pitch pieces online, look at them, look at successful ones and see what builds those pitch pieces is to take a visual thing and to be able to tell about the story in, in a compelling, passionate way that's very concise but then tells the financial reason why this makes sense. Because people aren't just gonna hand, I mean, you might have some people that do this, but most people are not going to hand you whatever the amount of money that it takes to make a decent film or a decent story for um, some over, um, over the computer, you know, feeding kind of streaming service without wanting some type of return on the investment or to not think that you're gonna walk away with however much money that is per, uh, per episode or per film and not be able to make something back on it. It was, first of all, it's, in my book, it's a little irresponsible to make art for art's sake when you're in the film industry, because although it employs people on a certain level, if you, all it's gonna do is go sit on a shelf somewhere and nobody's ever gonna watch it, 
I really don't know what the point of it was because it's an art form that's intended for an audience. It's not intended to just hang in my you know, bedroom over my bed and I admire it. Although there are probably people that have their own little private theaters and just show their friends. That exists, you know, that kind of stuff exists. But again, this is an art form that evolved particularly for, um, for audiences. So for people that are giving money to make these, and that's generally what you're pitching for. You're not pitching, you know, because you just like the story, you're trying to get people to do it with you. You're pitching because you want to fund your picture. Mm -hmm. And so you'll need a pitch deck. You need a, a visual pitch deck, like I said, that's succinct. Um, there's even studies on what pitch decks, um, uh, what kinds of things go into a pitch deck that's successful. At Harvard's done studies, different people. And again, you're into the world of business. People are not going to think, oh, this is not fun. And it, it isn't fun sometimes. Mm -hmm. It isn't fun. But in a way, it is fun because you're finding a way to get your art made or to get your idea created. So Pitch deck needs to um, talk about the audience that you're trying to sell to. Why this? Why now? Um, who are the people that you would like to see play in this realistically? If you're asking for a $5,000 budget, don't think you're going to be able to put Samuel L. Jackson, who's the number one box office earner in the world, into that unless you personally know Samuel L. Jackson. And he, he's told you, hey, I'll do that with you if you get a few dollars, you know, whatever. <laughs> because yep. that's, that's realistic. You know, you want an A-list actor, you need an A-list budget. Yes. You know, they are, there are the occasional drop-ins for low budget things and, and people do it because they think it's a really interesting script, mm -hmm. but you got to get it in front of them and you got to get it past their gatekeepers. Um, who was it? I saw on a, oh, Elf. There's this fantastic show on Netflix for anybody who's interested in the film industry. Um, it's on Netflix and it's uh, the films that made us or something like that. The title let me look that up really quick um anyway it tells you every aspect of how a film came about back to the future elf um i've forgotten there's a there's like 10 or 11 titles in there but it is so useful to watch because it'll talk about the scripts how the script came to be how it became a project how it got funded and how it got launched and distributed uh in the whole thing um so i highly recommend that people watch that um because it's that made us. Huh? What's it called? the movies that made us the movies that made us yeah it's the movies that made us yes and it's fantastic because um you will see what challenges these people went through and how they <laughs> made some big mistakes you know along the way um some of them you know to the point to the point of licensing where it could kill their projects because again there's so much to know in putting together films mm -hmm. you know the, the media law and um, contract law and all the different pieces that get there, but this will give you a really great overview. Right. I, I love this series. It's probably one of the best out there and it's fun. They make it fun along the way for you to watch it. Okay. So you're not going to die of, you know, today they typed seven pages. And <laughs> <laughs> because I can tell you in the course of making a film, sometimes there's 200 or more iterations of a script. Yep. Now, I don't know if you're a writer well, I know you are, Linda. Yeah. If you're a writer and somebody wants you to tweak your script 200 times, you end up, and I have talked to a couple of writers, they hate that script by the time the show is made. <laughs> they hate it, you know, because they've had to, you know, punch on it, chunk it out, change it so many times that, it, you know. Yeah, there has been plenty of times when I have hated something I've painted. I have hated something I'm writing, like book five right now. So. <laughs> but it makes it so it fun. So because <laughs> it's not, like I said, sometimes you really do bleed for your art. <laughs> yes, you do. Just open the veins. Just write. <laughs> oh, it's so true. But anyway, yeah, watch that. And that will give you a super idea of the whole production process and, and why a pitch is so important and where they pitched and how they pitched their particular piece. But there are pitch pieces that are online. One of my favorites is from Stranger Things mm -hmm. that um, you can find online and actually look at their pitch Bible and why it's so good. Yep. You know, literally that that made such an, a fantastic series. Those guys were super fun and drew from their childhood films that they loved to help create their own story, right. you know, later on out of the genres of films that they, they enjoyed. But um, yeah, there's a lot of pitch pieces to look out pitch bibles but choose successful ones try to find the ones that you're that people are favorite if it's your favorite see if you can find something that talks about how they pitch that story 
yeah. you know, online. So there, you may or may not find it, but it might lead you to some others that are similar. So, right. so once you get you pitched, they've accepted it. The, a studio or a production company accepts the the books or the novels or even the script if you're brave enough to submit one. <laughs> with that, um, what comes next? Development. Um, well, assuming? depending on the, the depending on the deal. Okay. The war begins. <laughs> <laughs> the fun part because, the negotiation. well yeah because if you're if you're the creator yeah. and you can remain a creator and and somewhere in the in the creative team you're golden mm -hmm. but if you're not and you sell your script outright i'm telling you and I, I tell this to people all the time if you don't own the rights to something and they take it and they they can do anything they want they can sit it on a shelf and it can be there for 20 years gathering dust if you've given them a full option on it or without a time limit. Um, or they can take it and with another writer, you know, especially if it's WGA, if there are certain amount of iterations, you, you can almost be written out of your own, your own original script. And WGA you know? is Writers Guild of America? Yes, writer, there's Writers Guild East and Writers Guild West. Um, get to know guilds, get to know writers associations that protect you as a writer, mm -hmm. because ironically, writers sometimes are the absolute beginners of every story, but sometimes get very mistreated in this industry. Um, go read the story about the guy that wrote Forrest Gump. Mm -hmm. um, go read about Art Bookwald and um, the original, shoot, what's that movie? Tra uh, not, no. no, not trading places. The one about with Eddie Murphy coming to America, coming to, coming America. to America, and how Art Bookwald um, sued and all the years and problems that that took because he had presented an original format and it got stolen. It or not. got <laughs> taken. Well, <laughs> you know, he, yeah, his 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 um, story was co-opted in a certain fashion and he eventually won that lawsuit. So I can say that since he won, that he it was his piece. However, it was um, changed or altered by the, the executives using, excuse me, a very famous artist who also got sued yet again by another woman who had a story that was like that and he had knowledge of. So uh, an idea or a, a thing not written down and unprotected is just an idea and anybody can use it. Mm -hmm. But once you have written something, do the due diligence to get your intellectual property protected, you know, protect yourself, get involved with guilds, get involved with people that know how to help protect your art form. Because again, there's every, this is a place where money, you know, anytime there's money, there are going to be people that want to exploit your paintings. There are people that want to exploit artists that have talent. And there's always somebody want to make money off of your creativity. Right. Always, especially okay. if you're good, mm -hmm. they want to make money off your creativity. So not a bad thing because, but you need to share and you need to get the share that you are supposed to get, mm -hmm. you know, and um, to this date, the most highly funded script, I think, is Will Ferrell, Four Million Bucks. And I think it was Step Brothers, maybe. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. It was one of those crazy movies that he did. But yeah. And people think, oh, people make a killing. You know, that the guy from Forrest Gump made a killing. They redlined him out of reality. Mm -hmm. That where Forrest Gump, <laughs> he got almost, he had to sue to get his uh, money out of a movie that was mega buck earn. Yeah. So... <laughs> It's, it's a whole lot of people involved in the commercial arts in every form that, and, and even as an artist, and this is why it's so great for, for this association, is for you to learn to control the, the vantage point of your art form yeah. and to learn to um, uh, own the commerciality of your art form. Because people have been known to come along a roadside stand and buy a, a, an art piece and then turn it into a mega dollar earning something mm -hmm. without your permission without but you bought it outright and you sold it outright right. and there are no contracts with painters generally there are no contracts generally in how people are going to use that artwork in whatever form now let me tell you music if you want music rights to something you need you know you've got to know where it's going to be heard whether it's radio tv broadcast whatever then you've got to charge for a licensing fee and whatever i don't see artists doing that 
No. You know, they're, they're charging licensing fees. Unless you're really a commercial artist, they don't do it. Well, and keep in mind, let's let's all share our paintings on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. And with the common common creative laws, I believe they're called uh -huh. now. I mean, mm -hmm. they basically, I, I just did a little research. These common creative laws is something new. This wasn't out 10, 15 years ago. The minute that you put it in the public domain, it's fair game. And well, putting it in social media is public domain. So it's like, I'm, you know, I've already started, shared some stuff. My books are copyrighted. And, mm -hmm. um, but every, this is where I think copyright law needs to kind of be re rewritten because everybody goes under the assumption that because I created it, I, I have an, a copyright on it automatically. And that doesn't hold up in court. It, well, it, it does not generally. Been, yeah. Media law is, is um, being formed by uh, cases at this mm -hmm. point because the government can't keep up with how drastically and how fast media has changed and right. the evolution of transmedia and all those things. Mm -hmm. So literally it's lawsuits that are setting precedent that are actually codifying how we're viewing these kinds of things and um and how people use those products and whatever yeah you've got to play your cards close close to your chest that's one of my favorite right you know, things from life is that you these are your cards this is the things that are of value to you how much are you going to um put out there where people can get it i mean there's ways to protect your um your uh, images from being captured there's ways to protect your images if you're selling them in a shop to prevent people from um, getting them, you know, for exclusive use. I mean, you literally uh, when you're, you know, signing purchases, there are cer certain shops that are very, very well set up to protect your rights. There are others that, you know, just give it up. You've just thrown away all of your potential, you know, on something. And right. you don't know, you don't know what might capture somebody's imagination and want to use it for something. Yeah. But, you know, I've, um, I've kept you on here pretty oh. long time. Um, so what I, what I'd like to do, Karen, at this point, um, naturally we'll have you back again, um, and we can talk about a number of different things, but, um, I'm just going to, uh, ask one general question at the end. Is there anything that you would like to, to talk about that we haven't touched on, uh, yet, um, something around independent film versus the studio group or, um, you know, how you review screen scripts for possible production, um, anything in, in that realm or well, any advice that you might want to give us? Most, almost no production companies accept scripts or um, pieces from outside sources without some type of, um, we're soliciting it from someone. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is the legality issues, is that everybody in the world wants to sue you <laughs> because you might have taken an idea from their thing and, and it's just gotten so litigious that um, that's really hard to do. Um, independent versus studio. A studio, is, especially right now, is the poorest risk taker in the market. <laughs> and if you, if you are looking for a studio to do your work, please don't. You know, please try to figure out some other way to get your production made because studios want they, they want to eat up hot scripts and then they don't want to take the risk necessarily to make them. And I, I know so many people who have not had a time value set on their option. And so their option is drawing dust while they while they dream or they get upset or they think, you know, it's going to happen. And I say this and everybody always doesn't want to believe me, but the average script time from the time of you creating it to the time it gets actually made is 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I've had people argue with me about that and argue with me about it and say that's not true, but that's the statistic because of all the people and all the things it takes to put together a production and over time and to pitch it and to find financing and to make sure you're not doing securities violations and all those kinds of things. So you, patience is a virtue in creativity. And especially since you, if you need money mm -hmm. and um, it's much faster to do something that's in television and series kind of things than it ever is to do a film. Mm -hmm. So 
think that. There's also more money. There's 180 billion, I think, in um, series production. And there's only like 44 billion in film production. So heavy on the TV series, people. <laughs> yeah. That's, That's the way people consume now. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Right. It, it, it naturally is. I so watch a lot more series than I do movies at this because point. Because you're a novel writer and you get more information in a series. I get more of the novel in a series mm -hmm. than I do in a film. Yep. So I love it too. I prefer series. Mm -hmm. I prefer it, that. It's really kind of interesting as um, I have a, a couple other friends, actually a, a mutual friend that John and I know and is also a honorary member, George Gallo, uh, uh -huh. screenwriter. Yeah, you know, George. Okay. And then um, there's another good friend, also an honorary member, Dick Atkins, who is a, uh, who's up in New York, used to do uh, soap operas for P&G actually. So connection there. Um, and he also has done three feature films, um, lots of different backgrounds. So, I, you know, I have a lot of, um, like you can say, I don't, information um, yeah. from them about how you go into development and then you know, you can get what we call development hell, where like you were saying, it gets up on a shelf and it just collects dust for years. And, you know, is there a way to get around that? There was another, I haven't seen anything lately. I don't know if it um, actually got caught. Let's just put it that way. But there was somebody out there pitching that, you know, if you're a writer and you want to write a script and, and you want to get this produced, you know, come pay us <laughs> X amount of money when we'll put a producer mentor uh, on, you know, with, to work with you and it only costs us much money. And I'm like, I'm, I listened to the pitch and I'm sitting there looking at it going, all I'm doing, dude, is giving you money and making you rich while I sit here <laughs> and not get anywhere. <laughs> Cause yeah. you know, he, their, their biggest pitch was we have like a hundred things in development. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that. You know? Well, they have these. These are companies that um, Writers Group of America and people are, are fighting against. They're packaging people, yeah, and they're always trying to find some. And just like producers in music, they're mm -hmm. always sitting waiting for their next prey that they can take your money because you're passionate about your artwork. You're passionate. You do not pay people. People pay right. you. Yes. So get that in your head. People pay you. You are not paying people. Now you might pay people to help you. Um, fine tune or whatever that are real consultants, editors, whatever consultants. But yeah, yes. be super careful and make sure they've got a good track record of of um, wins. You know, so that you paying somebody that couldn't get you there. Right. But yeah, packaging people, they're the worst scabs in this industry, and I, I can't stand them. One of the guy, I had a guy walk away from a project with me that we were in. You know, looking for funding and literally had contracts with us. And me in particular on um, ownership that he literally walked with a packaging company. <laughs> and I, I, you know, he, he'll have serious, I've got the legal ability to shut his production down because I own 50% of it. But, mm. you know, he wants to pretend that that's not real. And I, I'm like, you run with that, baby. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you just run with that. And so, uh, and, you know, it's sad. He first said he didn't even have it. So there's everything out there. And I told him not to even listen to those people. I told him what they were. And I'm sure that he probably coughed up maybe forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for him. I'm sure. And I feel really sad, but I can't feel that sad because, you know, if you don't listen to wise counsel, then that's the way it works. But um, yeah, I, I had a couple key questions. They wanted me off that call really quickly uh -huh. because I, yeah. I knew enough from yeah, yeah. all of my, the, the contacts that I had that I knew better than to, you know, okay, we're only going to leave it at this price for five more minutes. So you can leave it to that price for the next five years and I'm not going to be paying you anything. <laughs> so yeah. you can go back in history and look at some of the tragic stories of people that were highly creative mm -hmm. about things that have happened to them along the way. Exactly. So yeah, it, it's, um, it's, it's really a crazy thing, you know, Right. But um, I, I was trying to answer the thing about the studio. Oh, on the independent okay. side, um, what I wanted to say was the independent side will allow you as a creative to have more control over the thing that you love than any place in the in the world. But you can't you cannot ever as a writer control everything because as soon as a director is hired, he now has a vision for unless you're the one hiring him, he now has a vision for what you're doing that may or may not meet your expectations. Mm -hmm. 
And he may want to revise your story into places, especially if you don't own some part of your option or some control of your option that they can do pretty much anything they want. So, but that you have more chance on the indie side than you ever will on a studio side. Mm -hmm. I had um, the piece that um, we're trying to launch shortly was actually John Cherry's piece I talked about at the very beginning. It was actually optioned by HBO and got an HBO hell for a while mm -hmm. as they changed executives. Oh my so God. So that it laid there and laid there while people kept coming and going through this to where it was greenlit, but then became temporarily on hold to become nobody even knows it exists. So the option ran out. Uh -huh. So yeah, but, uh, it's a historic piece. So we're hoping to reintroduce it now that time has passed, now that, you know, hopefully there's some settlement and there's really not because AT&T just bought um, uh, HBO Discovery uh, Warner window. So that's one big thing now, Warner Discovery Plus and HBO's in that mix. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah so so. <laughs> ride the wave, you know, ride the wave. If you're looking for distribution, this is the way it's, it's working. Yeah. You know? Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's why I said 10 years, <laughs> 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 you know, things change. You, you just have to, you know, change is the one constant be, be aware. Yeah. So. And you know, then there's always that, um, the piece of that of, you know, if I look at the different series that are being done and the, the different movies that are out there, there's always that they would much rather go with someone they know than uh -huh. someone they don't know, right? I mean, it's it's like who you know in the business, like it is who you know in, in the business world, you know? Um, all of that's still part of it too, I'm sure. Well, and, and there's good reason for that mm -hmm. because as if you get into this, the more you get out there in the art world, and you start meeting the number of charlatans that are out there, you, they have become socially dependent upon who that they know. Mm -hmm. Because I, I had one guy tell me he was on his film set and this guy had been embezzling all the film money for the whole project. And he at one point tells them all that he is God. He's the creative God. And as the creative God, he walked with all the money of the production. <laughs> So that's the scary part, you know, right. that's where good checks and balances on a, um, on a production, a corporation and all have to be set in place. You, you need to protect your investors. That's a prime part of your directive as the creative above the line team is, you know, as a producer and executive producer, you protect the money and in production, you got to beat up the director and keep him in line. Executive producer, you got to make sure the producers are accounting to the um, to the investors. The whole thing. It's a it's a real marriage of um, of again collaboration. Yeah, because money, money itself is a language and an art mm -hmm. and business. So you know, get to know as much about that as you can. Whether you like it or not, it's part of your life. Yep, yep, <laughs> yeah. it has to be done. So John, do you have any any final questions for Karen? No, I'm still smiling from everything we've talked about. <laughs> and I can't wait to listen to it uh, when you get when you post it, and uh, hope we can do this again. Yeah, yeah, I'm um, sure we will. Yeah. Um, so, Karen, uh, thank you so much for being on our chat today, and thank you for being one of our honorary members. I'm sure we'll be in touch on a, a number of different things, and like I said, we'll have you back on our chat in the future. Um, maybe we can check in on some projects that you have going on and uh, what the progress is on some of that. And you mentioned some of them in, in our show here. Uh, so we really do appreciate the fact that you gave us your time this morning. Time is money. No so thank you so I much. I enjoyed it. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> yeah, and it was very nice to meet you somewhat face to face. <laughs> so, very nice to meet you. Yeah. yeah so take care. Um, that's all that we we have for today. Uh, like again, thanking Karen and John for joining us, and tune in next time. Um, I'll be probably recording sometime in July, and I'll uh, check out check out our social media and blogs at artisticharmonies.com, and you'll be informed. So, bye everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. And a wonderful talk with Karen Espina of Hummingbird Productions. If you would like to contact Karen, you can do so. If you're on the watching the video, you will see her email address pop up here. If you are listening to the audio, you can contact Karen at K-E-S-P as in Paul, E-N-N.
A-N-T at gmail.com. Thank you all for listening. We'll catch you next time on Art Chat. Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us.